I bring a message um, continuing with our study on the Kingdom Parables, Stories for Life, a message entitled RSVP ASAP. And you know what ASAP means, it means as soon as possible. And you know what RSVP stands for, or what it means, do you know what the letters stand for? Anybody know? Yeah, it's French. Respondent, see the play. And uh, it's funny, I think nowadays people are having such a hard time getting people to respond, RSVPs, for weddings and such. We got a wedding coming up uh, this weekend, that they are getting creative in their invitations. And I found one of those creative ones, and I think you'll find this hopefully somewhat amusing. Uh, of course, the RSVP, please respond on May 1st, and uh, there's a place for your name, and then you can check, gladly attend, regretfully decline, resentfully attend, enthusiastically decline, or will decline to respond, but ultimately attend. And then, of course, the number for guests attending. Well, the, we're talking about invitations today, and uh, there is another parable that Jesus teaches in the context of Passion Week, uh, Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. And in this context, the Jewish leadership are kind of sparring and arguing with Jesus, and they're challenging his authority. He's done some things, and he said some things that they don't approve of, and they're challenging his authority. In fact, they directly ask him, who gave you this authority? But Jesus wasn't going to be baited into a direct conflict, uh, prematurely at least. He had that last week of ministry to do before he goes to the cross. He asked them a counter question that we'll, we won't talk about. But more importantly, he begins talking in parables. Last week we read the parable of the tenants. And this week we read the parable of the wedding banquet. And the key concept is invitation. Invitation. So, Matthew chapter 22, we'll read 1 through 14. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son, and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention, and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burnt their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants who went out to the road gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw that there was a man who had no wedding garment. He said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Here's our main idea for this morning. I articulated it this way. Only those who respond positively to God's invitation are his chosen kingdom citizens. Only those who respond positively to God's invitation are his chosen kingdom citizens. This parable predicts the consequences of rejecting God's salvation invitation. It's another parable on God's authority, the authority of Jesus to decide who enters the kingdom and on what basis. And more than anything, it underscores the dire necessity of responding positively to God's offer of salvation. So let's pause, have a word of prayer again, and then we'll see, uh, walk through these verses and you can see how the Lord will speak to us this morning. Heavenly Father, 
we do invite you once again to come and speak to our hearts. We pray that uh, all our attention would be focused on you and that your Holy Spirit would have full reign in our hearts this morning. I pray that the efforts I have made for preparation and study and, and, and uh, uh, the presentation of this message will be fruitful. I know your word is fruitful, but let me not be a distraction uh, to the people who have come here to hear your word today. Bring us your truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we begin in verse 1. And first we see that the invitations are extended. The invitations are extended. The setting of this parable, like I said, is a wedding banquet for a king's son. And this would be another contemporary illustration that the Jews would have been very familiar with. Specifically, the wedding feast was associated with the coming of the Messiah into his kingdom. And it's also a, a side note worthy of our attention that usually in the ancient world, a wedding feast could last for days. It was a very joyous and special celebration. Always, uh, almost always, in the parables, the king represents God and the son represents Jesus, as it does here. And verse 3 says the king sent out wedding invitations as usual. But it says... They wouldn't come. Literally, the guests were not willing. They weren't willing to come. And this was shocking for the hearer. Those who were listening to the parable uh, would have been uh, just appalled. Uh, we'll talk about the implications of this rejection in a few minutes. But this uh, was a highly offensive breach of social etiquette. It was an extreme insult for the king to be rejected in this way. And so verse 4 says the king sent out ambassadors again, telling the invited guests that he had spared no expense. It was going to be a party of special magnificence and that everything was ready. He invites them again, come, come to the wedding feast. Kingdom principle number one is this, write this down. God's grace is extravagant. God's grace is extravagant. The gospel invitation is extended far and wide without discrimination, and it is a repeated invitation of God and his patience. Since the king represents God in this parable, I think this is another lesson in God's patience and love and long-suffering and his grace. And while we shouldn't over-allegorize the parable, uh, the reality, though, is that Israel's history was one that God sent spirit-filled prophets again and again and again and again to his people, calling them back and encouraging them to repentance to himself. Of course, in the church age, after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, God sent his Holy Spirit. He sent the gospel message. He sent his apostles and his church and the word of God as it was completed um, out into the world, starting in Jerusalem, then into Samaria, Judea, uh, and to the ends of the earth, and like I've said, so that today there's hardly a corner of the world where the word of God isn't preached, and it's still going out, um, not just to the Jews, but to the Gentiles as well. The gospel invitation is extended far and wide without discrimination. Matthew will eventually write in Matthew 28, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. God's grace is an extravagant grace. He didn't just make salvation available to you by sending his son Jesus, uh, his own son, his very own son, his one and only son, to die for your sins. He sovereignly directed that message uh, to come down through the ages from generation to generation, from faithful witness to faithful witness, uh, faithful messenger to faithful messenger, across mountains, plains, seas, oceans, uh, across cultural barriers, language barriers. It is amazing how hard God has worked to bring the gospel to you. And that is why it's such uh, a harsh offense to God for someone to reject it. You know, in, um, in our little country church, we used to sing an old hymn, and it's not in our hymnal, not that I could find now. Maybe it's never used in Baptist hymnals. I don't know. This was a, a Christian church. and But maybe some of you will know these words. All things are ready. 
Come to the feast. Come, for the table now is spread. Ye famishing, ye weary, come, and thou shalt be richly fed. In the chorus, hear the invitation. Oh, whosoever will, praise God for full salvation, or whosoever will, will. Hear that good news today. God's grace is an extravagant grace. The invitations are extended to you and to me and whosoever will hear and come and believe. Is it, a, it is an extravagant grace that we must receive that invitation. So that's my encouragement for you today. In verse 5 through 8, secondly, we see, sadly, that the invitations are rejected. Are rejected. They're sent out, they're extended, but they're also rejected. Despite the king's extravagant grace, his offer, his tempting appeal, uh, that the, the, the slaughtered calf is ready, it's going to be a great feast, come, please come and attend, says that the guests refused to come. They weren't willing. Verse 5 says that they paid no attention, or literally that they didn't care. And we see the excuses, one to his farm, another to his business. Basically, the idea is that they were what? Too busy. Too busy. How often do we use that excuse? I'm too busy. Too busy to go to a king's wedding feast? Are you kidding me? They're too busy. And that's not the worst of it, though. Look at verse 6. It says that some even seized the king's ambassadors, treated them shamefully, and killed them. And the allegory is becoming more clear, isn't it? Uh, these are the prophets that Jesus has talked about in previous parables, like John the Baptist, <clears throat> who were mistreated and killed by the Jews. Within the situation of the parable itself, the killing of the king's ambassadors and servants would have been nothing less than treason, which explains the king's harsh reaction in the next verse. It says in verse 7, the king was angry and sent troops to punish them. He destroyed those murderers and burned their city. That's an extreme punishment, but it's fitting for an extreme crime. And it was a, a punishment reserved for insurrections. If the story was more of a reflection of history, I think the, the sacking of Jerusalem um, in the Old Testament and the hauling off of the Jews to, to Babylon is probably in view. If it's more of a New Testament or, or a future foreshadowing, uh, in 70 AD, Jerusalem was uh, sacked and burned by the Romans again. Um, but I don't really want to take my interpretation in those directions. It's really not the point. The point is that the king punished those wicked, rebellious people who spurred his authority and rejected the offer of his messengers. And since the king represents God in this parable, I think it's fair to say that although God is extremely patient and merciful and gracious, not wanting any to perish, but desiring all to come to salvation, that although God's grace is an extravagant grace, there is a temporal end to that offer, for his, his forbearance will eventually come to an end. Uh, for individuals and for collective mankind, at some point, the door, the offer of salvation closes, and then there's nothing more that can be done. That's a sober reminder for us, uh, believers, to be praying and working toward the salvation of the lost. And it's a warning for unbelievers to reconsider their rejection of that invitation of God's grace. But in verse 8, the king is still going to have a big party. There's no doubt about it. It doesn't matter who's on the guest list, who comes. Notice that Jesus says, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. They were not worthy. Our second thought is this, kingdom principle number two, rejecting the invitation makes one unworthy for kingdom citizenship. What does this unworthiness talk about? What does it really boil down to? It's really not about their personal holiness or behavior or morality or anything of that nature. It's based on the fact that they reject the invitation. It's a lack of, it's not about a lack of status or a lack of wealth or some kind of relationship to the king. Uh, for the sake of the parable, the one thing that made them unworthy was their rejection of the invitation. And I think it's the same with the kingdom of God. None of these things 
qualify, uh, disqualify an individual from entering the kingdom and being saved. Race doesn't matter. Gender doesn't matter. Social or economic status doesn't matter. All of the things, or at least many of the things that our culture and society uses to differentiate people and segregate people, none of those things are used for God's acceptance into his kingdom. What is it that matters? It's the heart. It's the heart. The heart that demonstrates faith by accepting the invitation for salvation. As we look at verses 8 through 10, then, we see also that the banquet hall will be filled. Third, the banquet hall will be filled. The king commands his emissaries to hit the streets and divide everyone. And this is now the fourth time that Jesus has used that root word, invite. Jesus, I think, is telling us, teaching us, that the most important thing in life is responding positively to God's offer of salvation. Now, this could be a, a hint uh, that salvation is going to be extended to the Gentiles, but again, that's really not the point. The point is that the king, God, reserves the right to invite whoever he wants to to his kingdom, Jew, Gentile, uh, whoever. He chooses whoever he wants to to come to the banquet, and the invitation is open. So then verse 10 says that the king's servants went far and wide and gathered as many people as they, they could find. And look at that phrase, the good and the bad. I mean, does anybody, Carolyn, are you going to go out on the street and just invite any roughhouser into the, 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 the wedding party this weekend? No way. But that is the grace of God so that the king's banquet hall will be filled. Our third kingdom principle is this. Kingdom citizenship comes by accepting the invitation, not by personal merit. It's not by good works. It's not by doing good things or praying enough or, or attending church enough or giving enough tithes and offerings. None of those things. Those are all works that we do because we love God and because we are saved. It's not by our works, but it's by accepting the invitation. Without the, taking that illustration too far, I think it's important again to notice that there is no individual merit to those who attend the banquet. Even the riffraff off the street are welcome to attend. As the gospel writers use the phrase prostitutes and tax collectors, the dregs of the society, the worst of the worst are welcome in God's kingdom. All they need to do is accept the invitation, uh, salvation by grace through faith and repentance. It's as easy as A, B, C. We're going to have Vacation Bible School coming up in a couple um, uh, months here, and, and we always teach the ABCs of becoming a Christian. Uh, a, to admit that you're a sinner in need of a Savior, recognizing that need, that you need Jesus as a Savior. B, B believe that Jesus is that Savior who died for your sins and was physically, literally raised from the dead. And then C, to commit, to commit your life to Jesus through public profession of faith and following Him as Savior and Lord. It's as easy as A, B, C. So that we see in the end, verse 10, that the wedding hall is filled with guests. The party, it's going to be great. It's still going to be great. But the parable's not over. There's a parable within the parable. And here is a, a, another lesson that comes. All you need is accept, to accept the invitation. That's all you need. But proper attire is still required. Proper attire is still required. Verses 11 through 14. It's still a wedding after all. And it's still the king's son. He can't just show up in dirty blue jeans and a t-shirt as much as I'd like that. Have you seen these designer or pretty dirty jeans that have come out recently? They're pre-stained uh, with all kinds of work soot on them. And I thought about getting some of those, but I already have to prepare at home. Um, you can't show up even in those. Uh, you need a sport coat, at least. Ha has anyone ever been to a restaurant where you were required to wear a sport coat? Not me. I'm not that classy. <laughs> but some of you have. And that's the situation here. 
And it's another twist, an interesting twist of the story. The king comes into the banquet hall, and you can visualize this. He's scanning the audience, um, all these good and bad people pulled off the street, but he noticed one guest who's not dressed for the party. There's a couple interpretations that I've read, and here's the one that resonated with me, okay? Uh, and although these details are not provided in the parable, um, the king likely provided the guests with proper clothing. This was a common uh, practice in the ancient world, and after all, these people were pulled off of the streets, and so, but this man came in his own clothes. The king provided some clothes, but he came in his own clothes. He didn't want to wear the king's clothes. You see, that's a bigger insult than not even coming to the wedding. To come in your own clothes, what's the point? What's the point? I think today's final kingdom principle is really important to hear. You enter the kingdom on God's terms, not your own. God's terms, not your own. It's possible that there is symbolism here of being clothed in the righteousness of God, the righteousness of Christ, and not your own. Uh, it's not spelled out in the parable, but it certainly fits with historic Christian doctrine and belief that Christians are given an alien righteousness, a righteousness that's not of our own doing, but provided by God, that justification through Jesus Christ, that when we believe in him, he takes our sin and he gives us his righteousness. Revelation 3, 5, there's some imagery there. It says, the one who conquers will be clothed in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name <clears throat> before my father and his angels. We've talked recently about Zechariah 3, where the high priest Joshua stands before the Lord and he has filthy garments on. He's accused by Satan. But the angel of the Lord comes and replaces his filthy garments. He says, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. I think there's some rich imagery here that is appropriate. But the bigger point is this. You enter the kingdom of God on his terms, not your own terms. When asked why he wasn't clothed for the wedding, he doesn't have a response. He's speechless. So the king commands him to be bound hand and foot and thrown into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. A phrase that Jesus usually uses in the context of eternal judgment and hell. Uh, it's a, the idea that it's a punishment of inconsolable grief and regret outside the warmth of the banquet hall. Now this specific parable is directed against the scribes and the Pharisees, Sadducees that had rejected God's holy will. They had rejected God's uh, Holy Spirit and God's Holy Son. They had insulted the King of glory. They were in the very process of plotting to kill him, their Messiah. And this is what Jesus uh, teaches in their presence. Who's in charge here? Who's got the authority? It's God. God has the authority through his son Jesus. And he is the one who sets the conditions for entering the kingdom. Like I said last week, you play by God's rules or you don't play at all. It's God's kingdom. It's God's world. It's God's rule and reign. And he has a punishment reserved for those who despise and reject his authority and refuse his gracious invitation. And so we come to verse 14, and verse 14 is the punchline, and this makes some Christians squirm because it's hard, it's difficult, it's hard to understand, and, and it's hard for us to work out. Jesus provides a one-sentence explanation of the story. He says, for many are called, but few are chosen. And we can think about it this way. The gospel is proclaimed far and wide. The invitation is sent out liberally without discrimination to all people everywhere, but only those who are chosen, or what sometimes the scripture says, the elect, a term used by Jesus and the apostles, are identified as true disciples. They are the true citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Many will hear the good news of salvation, but comparatively few respond in faith. And that's hard to understand. And uh, some of us are not at a maturity level uh, to receive that yet, Pray about it and, and search the scriptures. 
But the Bible teaches both a human responsibility to choose to follow Jesus, and that we're responsible for that choice, but also a divine sovereignty somewhere mixed in there that mysteriously God chooses those who will be saved before the world began. Uh, I think it's balanced to say that those who reject God's call of salvation do so of their own free will and therefore deserve exclusion from the kingdom. But those who accept God's call of salvation do so because of God's grace uh, from before all time began. It's a genuine invitation to come. Whosoever will, whosoever hears, but whosoever will certainly would not if it were not for the grace of God, the extravagant grace of God. Now I've got a video I want to close with from Chosen People Ministries, and this is a great story. I want to have John play a great confession uh, of a Jew who comes to faith in Jesus. Listen to this awesome testimony. Here's what you need to do. You've got to first shave your head. You dress all in black. You've got to wear a white robe, eat only kosher foods. You've got to become a vegetarian. You face Jerusalem. You've got to face India when you pray. You pray only in Hebrew and you grow a nice big beard. And if you do all of those outward cultural things, you'll discover the God of the universe. And I'm thinking this is crazy that someone thinks that they can force their culture on God and that God's going to be impressed by what you wear, what direction you face when you pray, what you eat, and all these sorts of things. It seemed to me that if there was a God out there who could be known, he should be able to be recognized no matter where I face, no matter how I'm dressed, because he's God. Growing up, we always understood that we had our Bible and the Gentiles had their Bible, the New Testament and that they were two completely separate books. Because the only people I knew who were believers in Jesus were all people in our public school who were Italian Catholic, I imagined that Jesus was Italian. And so the understanding that he's actually Jewish was, was a shock. And then to hear that the New Testament was written by Jews, I, I couldn't believe it. My expectation was that the New Testament was like my grandparents had told me. It was a, a book on how to persecute the Jews and it's something you should stay away from. Of course, when you're told you should stay away from something, <laughs> curiosity gets the best of you and you've got to see it. When I opened the New Testament, I was expecting to find a handbook on how to persecute the Jews. My grandparents had warned me that it was written by people who killed the Jews. That's what I was expecting to see. And yet when I'm opening it, I'm reading a story written by Jews about Jewish people. The New Testament was a fascinating book. And so as I opened this book in the library, I kind of looked around, made sure that none of my friends had seen me taking a Christian Bible off the shelf. And I open it, here's the first sentence. It says, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So three people are mentioned, and they're all Jewish. I was very shocked. And as I continue to read, I'm reading the story of a Jewish man who was born in a Jewish village, in a Jewish country, and one day walks into a synagogue and announces that he is the Messiah. The more I read the words of Jesus, the more I became attracted to him. It was as beautiful as anything I had ever read in any other part of the Bible. As I came to faith that Yeshua, that Jesus was the Messiah, it was clear that that was the most Jewish thing I could do. This is not the person who's a renegade to our people. This is the one who was promised in our Bible. It's the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. It is astonishing. If you would just read that chapter, just without the Bible being around it, you would say, oh, this is some Christian Bible. This is Jesus. <laughs> when you realize, though, that it's in the middle of our Bible, our Jewish Bible. When I first came to faith, I dared not tell my father um, because this is a time period in the, the 1970s when there were lots of gurus and cults. And he was very concerned about me getting involved in some crazy sect and going off someplace. So I waited for months. 
And uh, when I finally told him, he was very skeptical. On his own then, he started to read about Jesus as well. About a year and a half later, I told him that the fellow who wrote one of the books that he had read, that this fellow was giving a lecture in the city of New York. And he agreed to come out to hear that person. And uh, one of the most amazing moments of my life was, the speaker said, would everyone here who is a Jewish believer in Jesus, would you raise your hand? And I raised my hand. My father also raised his hand. And I said, I looked over, I said, Pop, he didn't say would all the Jews raise their hand. He said, would all the Jewish believers in Jesus raise their hand? And my father looked over and he said, yes, I, I heard what he said. The decision to come to faith in Jesus as the Messiah was not something that was a momentary lark. It wasn't something that was a passing fad. And I could see changes in myself that I knew were not from within myself. I had kind of tapped in to a truth for our Jewish people that was very powerful. What a great testimony of a Jewish man who heard the invitation and believed and followed. And now he is doing ministry, telling his testimony, bringing others uh, to discipleship in Jesus Christ uh, as well. Only those who respond positively to God's invitation are his chosen kingdom citizens. Let's pray and have, uh, have a time of invitation as our musicians come forward. Heavenly Father.